Hello, Kevin. Hello, Andrew. And hello, Mark. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Very good. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. How's things been uh, on your side? It's been a, a little while since we spoke to you last. It's, it's been a, it's been a very great busy period, you know, despite despite the fact that many financial institutions are putting off decisions with with COVID, where where they are taking decisions, they have fewer places to go to. That's always good if you're providing services to my sort of industry. Yeah, and I suppose just uh, on that, Kevin, I've given a, the listeners a brief introduction to your background and your career to date, but. Look, it might be a, a good start for you to give uh, give everybody listening today just a bit of a, an update as to what you're currently doing and, and how you're helping financial institutions in the market. Okay, so so I spent over two decades in, in financial services in the in the C-suite, either as head of compliance or as uh, chief compliance officer or, or um, chief risk officer. And normally, where I was chief risk officer, that also included uh, responsibility for for compliance. So I, so I did that over the two decades that I did that. Some of the time was spent with investment firms. So, so for example, uh, good money stockbrokers, uh, AMB investment managers, joint venture with uh, Bank of New York on, on the fund side. Um, and some of it was spent on the, on the banking side. So there's on the banking side of AIB, the banking side of Bank of Montreal uh, subsequently. And, and of course, before, before I did any of that, I was the head of regulation and, and trading in the, uh, in the stock exchange. Uh, so all of that took two decades. And what, what was common across that period was that the institutions I worked with took the view that the CRO or the chief compliance officer uh, should be on the management board. Uh, and in the case of AIB, that the management board was a management board of a, a credit institution licensed by the central bank. So, uh, so, so over those two decades, I've been around the compliance side, I've been around the risk side uh, because I've been a director of a, a, a regulated entity uh, I've also seen that, that side of it. Uh, so, so about two two years ago, uh, I decided to take the plunge and set up a, a business for myself, uh, which is called Priory GRC Consulting, and, and that that provides uh, advice mainly but not exclusively to financial institutions on all aspects of of governance, risk, and compliance. Brilliant. Well, fair play for taking the plunge and uh, and going out to do your own thing. And how have the last two years uh, gone for you? Generally, it's it's uh, it's gone well. It took me a little bit longer to, to get going, to be honest, than I expected, because what I'd expected is that uh, I was going to go into various financial institutions and say I have two decades of experience and, and this is it. You know, presumably you're just waiting for me to knock at the door and then we're going to start. And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it takes it takes a lot more to, to get a business up and running than that. Uh, but once I get over that initial period, uh, what what I'm finding is that. Uh, there's a there's a dearth of talent uh, within the the areas I'm talking about at, at senior levels, and you know particularly where there are where there's business change or where there are big projects that are going on, financial institutions are happy to to work with work with people who have the the, the relevant expertise. So that's that's given me some opportunities. And the other area which which has been interesting, and particularly on the governance side, has been the public sector, and that, that's broadly defined. So you know it includes, for example, some of the the sports bodies that are. Uh, are, are supported by the public purse. You know, they, they're, they, they're crying out for help on the governance side. And that's been the other area that has, uh, has been, been a, an area of activity. We, we mentioned, um, you know, over what has been a stellar career over the two decades uh, that you, you held positions as a, a chief compliance officer, chief risk officer. So no doubt you have first-hand exposure to the challenges that have been uh, presented by working within a, a central bank regulated firm. When we look at present day, what are the, I suppose, the challenges facing uh, CBI regulated firms, you know, from a risk perspective at the moment? Yeah, it's it's interesting because over the over the last four or five years, the standards that are expected by all of the stakeholders, but but in particular by by the regulator by the central bank, are, are rising consistently, and there, there are a couple of pressures on that. Um, if you go back to two thousand and fourteen, we started the single supervisory mechanism where Frankfurt took responsibility for the large banks and the large investment firms and where the, the rest of the activity was left to the local regulators. But it was left to the regulator, local regulators on the basis that you did things according to Frankfurt's rules. So what that led to is a very significant increase in standards across the board. So the, the other thing which has created pressure on this is the responsibilities of directors. So directors are, are well aware that they have responsibility, the ultimate responsibility for, for risk management. And they're looking to places like risk uh, to, to get their back. 
and to make sure that uh, they can sleep easy at night. The regulatory agenda, both of those existing and in terms of regulatory change, is huge. What, what goes with that is, is both a technical side about understanding all of that regulation, but also a project management side about getting sure that, that you're ready both strategically and, and operationally to, to get on with all of that. One of the pressures that, that there's been in the middle of all this has been the, uh, the pressures on getting top class people. Because if you're to have any hope as a, as a chief risk officer of delivering on this, you're going to need a top class team. And uh, getting that top class team is getting harder and harder. There's a war for talent. And some of the people that are, are in the war for talent are not just for the financial sector. So it's not at all unusual to discover that you're competing with Google, you're competing with, you're competing with Apple, you're competing with, uh, you're competing with the fintech sector. That's by, by no means unusual when you're, when you're in the middle of, of, of uh, looking for talent, which, which is in short supply in, in any event. So I mentioned that one of the things that I think the CRO needs to do is to, uh, to take much more of a strategic role uh, while also dealing with the, the operational side. And I think that, that what goes with that is more, a much greater focus on stakeholder management, on, on risk return rather than pure risk, and an involvement in some of the more strategic aspects of the business, such as setting the risk, risk appetite and making sure that there's a loop between the risk appetite and the strategy so that they're always, uh, they're always aligned. And data remediation. So the role, of, the role of information is becoming more and more important. And what's going with that is a, a premium on the ability to cleanse data both internal and external, so that you have relevant information, and then to have the skills on board to make use of that information. So those are some of the areas that, that I think are, are challenging the, the CRO today, and, and, and particularly with dealing with this after bank. Absolutely. No, and I, and I completely agree with you there. Just one thing I know you mentioned there about, obviously, the, the war for talent. We're actually seeing that on, on a daily basis. And you, you mentioned there because of the the regulatory changes, obviously, along the technical side and project management side, and these, these two have to kind of align to each other. Um, and obviously, because these changes, there's going to be, I suppose, a certain focus from the CBI. But what are the main technical areas that the CBI are actually looking for at the moment? There's a, there's a wide range of them, but if I look at some of the, the more important areas, and a lot of these are coming from, coming from uh, Brussels and from Frankfurt. Uh, so there's a, there's a, mm-hmm. if, if, you, if you take any given year and you look at the five or six key priorities of the central bank, and then you do the same exercise for the, for the, for the EBA or for the other European regulators, uh, what you find is that a lot of it is common. It, it's, not, it's not a one-for-one match, but there's a lot of it is common. So some of the areas that are that are turning up in this, uh, firstly, uh, capital liquidity assessment, including including risk appetite. So I think that um, what, one of the things that came out of the financial crisis, it's, it's 10 years ago at this stage, and more than 10 years ago at this stage, is that uh, liquidity is king. So there's been, a, there's been an increased focus on that, but at the same time, a focus on ensuring that the capital regime is much more robust. Because one of the things that happened uh, those days 10 years ago is that banks were playing around with their capital models. Uh, they were um, they were arguing between one regulator and another. Uh, a lot of what the changes that have been made on the capital front are to put a stop to that and to make sure that if there were another crisis, as for example, the crisis we have with COVID, uh, that the banks would be much better placed to, to respond to that. But what goes with that is a much greater emphasis on stress testing. Uh, so if it all goes, um, if, it all, if, all, if it all gets very difficult indeed, how robust can you be under stress? And a much greater focus on on how you do stress tests and how you use stress tests and making sure that there's greater consistency across Europe in connection with all of that. A lot of the areas that have been focused on in, in Ireland around conduct risk and consumer protection are also um, are also common across across Europe, as is financial crime. And financial crime is an area that every European regulator, certainly every main European regulator, has had in its top five for as long as I can remember. And it's an area where Brussels at this stage is saying, look, we need to have a more international effort and we want to be at the centre of that. Uh, some of the other areas which are which are, are coming up in lights on a consistent basis, credit risk management, and particularly the credit cycle, the whole, the, the, the from, from A to Z, from the time you take on the customer, evaluate the customer, follow up on problem cases, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, so it's for quite a number of years, both Europe and the, the Irish regulator has been focusing on how you get non-performing loans down. Um, and there's, a, there's an interplay between that and the conduct side, because some of the things that you would like to do to get loans down are more challenging to do in a manner which are consistent with your obligations in respect of, of conduct risk. Contingency planning is, is uh, playing into that space as well. And it's all around, look, if it all gets difficult, 
how well prepared are you to deal with that? Um, mm. Business model viability uh, is a big issue. Uh, and if you look at the what's coming out of that, it's not really surprising that it is because the return on equity that that the European banks are providing uh, is not particularly um, is not particularly strong. But what's going with that is that they're increasingly being be valued as as utilities. That there's an increasing divergence between, in particular, uh, the profitability of the, the U.S. banks versus the European banks. And not surprisingly, uh, both the European and the Irish regulator are much more focused on fine, you're doing all these things, but what are you getting out of it? Do you have a viable business model at, at the end of it? And then one last area that just mentioned is outsourcing. And outsourcing um, is, is particularly important for some industries like funds, uh, but it's also, um, it's, also, it's also important for various other areas. The Irish regulator issued a consultation paper, uh, which I don't believe has been finalized, but I think it's still a consultation paper, but it certainly is the guidance they're using, which runs over to 100 pages, uh, which talks about the risks of outsourcing and also the benefits and talks about you know how they'd like to see outsourcing being managed the big fear they have is that as international banks and international financial services companies increasingly come into the market they will outsource services but they will do it uh, without much of a presence in ireland and that's something they want to avoid at all costs so those are some of the areas which i think are, are right. more technical and which are which are up in light there's certainly a lot of them there, Kevin, and you talk a lot about kind of obviously the European focus and the Irish focus in terms of the regulators uh, and, the, you know, obviously what's in their kind of top five. Now, it might be hard to say, but I suppose in your opinion, with the current climate, what is the, the main focus of all those kind of technical areas with either the European or, or, or the Irish regulator at the minute? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, it's, it's, and it's, this is not just coming to Ireland, I think the biggest focus at the moment is on seeing how, how banks and financial institutions deal with the, the pressures associated with um, with COVID. And so some of those are around, around resilience. You know, if, if you have all of your staff or substantially all of your staff working from home, how does that work? Uh, if you discover that uh, demand for your services uh, goes through the floor because people don't want to borrow, how long can that go on for? And uh, does, does that sort of thing work? And then going into the conduct risk side, if you've re- if you've entered into agreements with customers for uh, concessions on on their um, on their mortgage or whatever it might be, how long does that play on for? And what do you do when you need to put that on a on a more uh, on a more permanent footing? Um, so I think the, the the broad theme of the issues that are falling out of COVID and making sure that resilience continues and that uh, the customer is also seen right in the middle of all that. Is, is a is a big focus interesting, to interesting right if, if we could move a little bit away from the, the the regulatory focus side of things and and something that i was quite surprised about was around that the, you know the regular actually does a culture audit and it, it's something that we actually wanted to bring up on, on this podcast as well and it's something i you know when myself and andrew were you know were preparing in this there was something that we weren't aware of so like when, when the regular does speak of culture what do they actually mean or what are they looking for yeah, I suppose that the interest of, of the regulation and culture, at mm. least in Ireland, probably goes back to about sort of 2015, 2016, that sort of, that sort of, uh, that sort of time. Where they, where they started on that was with the main banks. And they started on the main banks, you know, at, at a period when uh, the banks hadn't done themselves any favours in terms of uh, rebuilding trust with their, with their customers. They'd had all the tracker issues in the mm. middle of all that. Uh, so what the central bank did is they, they brought in the... The, the Dutch Central Bank, who would be regarded as being one of the, the world leaders in, in looking at all, all of this. Uh, at the same time, the ECB issued some papers trying to define what, what, what do we mean from, by, by culture and what, what, what influences a sound culture or whether you don't, what are the key things? And they came up with four. So they said the tone from the top, uh, clear accountabilities and responsibilities, open to, two-way communication, and remuneration and other incentives, which are consistent with where you're trying to get to. So that was the, that was the, the most recent start in connection with culture and defining what it was all about. And then Ed Sibley, who is uh, one of the deputy governors in, in the Central Bank, brought that up on further. And he said, yeah, that's all fine. That's absolutely right. But what I'm interested in, if you, if you look at the effect that individual actions at a senior management level but also group dynamics have on the firm uh, and on its reputation. Is that good or is that bad? And if you look at the way that you you carry out your risk activities, uh, and I mean that broadly, I don't mean just within the risk function, does that facilitate or does it deter appropriate behavior? And and then 
what are the answers to those two questions? What do we need to do to make sure that uh, the firm is in the position to optimize uh, the culture that it has in, in place on, on, on all of us? As they began to get, get under the bonnet on this, particularly with the banks, there was a large um, focus on trying to identify well, what are the norms, what are the, what are the philosophies, what are the values that, that banks have and that other financial institutions have that influence the way that they carry out their, their risk management, and reputation management, and what needs to happen to make sure that they get into a good place in connection with, with, uh, with all of that. So those, those were some of the, the, the influences that have brought us to the view of what, what culture is. From the regulator's perspective, if you if you know this, where were companies starting from in terms of their risk culture? Were, were they were they implementing quite a robust risk culture before they started to go in and actually really check this, or was it quite a low starting point? And they've got some way to go to, to where the central banks will be will be somewhat happy. You know, the, the financial sector is a very broad area. There's huge differences between, for example, some of the banks of the IFSC. And the and the and the, uh, the the main banks in, in the domestic market, but but if you if you were to generalise in connection with it, uh, it's a dangerous thing, of course, to do. But if you were if you were to do that, I think the starting point was quite low. The it doesn't matter which measure you take of trusted financial institutions. The answer comes back, um, they're they're trusted very little. So they had they have a bit of a mountain to climb to 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 regain all of that. The group that were involved in this was the thirty major international institutions. That commissioned a report to say internationally how, how far have things gone over the sort of period we're talking about, say over, say over the last five years. And I, I think what came out of it, and it would be very consistent with what I, what I think you'd see in Ireland, it would be that things are getting better, conduct risk and, and culture are getting much more attention in the boardroom, and the tone from the top is getting better. But there's still a bit to be done. So if you ask the question, is it fully embedded? And if you take the tone from the middle, and match it onto the tone from the top. Do you get the same? I'm not sure you do. Uh, whereas you, you really want to get that. You really, really want to get to a point where you know the culture that you want is consistently there at all levels, rather than being, for example, the directors of the MD or you know the senior management stating that the, the the desired culture. That of course is important, uh, but but it's by no means sufficient. Uh, so that's one of the areas that needs to, needs to. Um, uh, and what can be done, Kevin, to scrutinise more kind of employee conduct? You know, from your experience, how can they really ensure that it's it's going from the top down to the bottom? Well, I, I think one of the things that that uh, is happening in some cases to due to pressure from the central bank, but but in some cases, um, just because financial institutions are are focusing more on this sort of thing. It is to get somebody in to do an independent audit and say, well, look, wh where are you doing well and where are you doing badly? And where do you need to focus in order to get things get things uh, better? And what would typically happen on that sort of that sort of audit, uh, wh whether it was done by myself or by, by any of the other uh, the firms that are very, very good at it, is that you'll typically go through a whole lot of documentation. Uh, you know, there'd be things like, for example, what's the board looking at? What sort of regular what sort of correspondence do you have with your with your regulators? What sort of issues are coming up on a page or uh, those sort of issues? And what that's trying to do is say, what's the paper trail telling you about what the culture is in, in reality? And you typically supplement that with, with something like uh, staff surveys, which are carefully chosen, interviews throughout the organization, that sort of thing. And what that gets you is it gets you a pretty good fix uh, throughout all of the issues which are affecting uh, culture on where you're strong, where you're weak, where you need to do a bit more work. And I think that one of the things that, that is coming across the board is that board involvement is, is, is much stronger. But, but in some cases, boards have to work out, well, what do I need to do uh, to, to effectively champion this and oversee what's happening and make sure that the culture on the ground is where I want it to be, or if it's not, that at least I know where it's not so that I can, I can attend my, my, my attention. So those are some of the things I think you could do to move forward. But performance management, by the way, um, including incentives, are uh, very important because at the end of the day, if you have people getting paid for certain behaviors, or if you have people being promoted uh, for certain behaviors, or indeed on the other side, if they're being if they're being disciplined or, or cut out or whatever it might be, well, you're going to get uh, that would be a powerful um, impact on behaviors on the ground. So one of the things which would happen very early in any sort of um, cultural audit is to see, well, how's all that working? Or is it working? And, and you know, where are the weaknesses in the, in the middle of all that? What, I, I have yet to see a, re, a report for cultural audit that has been cleaned. 
even in places that have are doing it really well. What it typically says is you're doing very well in the following areas, but you've got you, you, you have room for um, further development there's, in other there's, areas. There's always room for improvement, Kevin, isn't there? <laughs> I, th- I think I think you're you're absolutely yeah, yeah. right about that. That's what every company is looking for. Looking from the top down, then you know when you know when we look at these senior level executives and they are trying to implement these type of type of cultures and so forth, or holding PCF registered roles and. I think over the last, you know, you know, the good to nearly eighteen months to two years, we've, we've seen a lot of new entrants come into the market across financial services, you know, across banking, payments, investment management, etc. And uh, from your own perspective, like, what, what trends are you seeing in terms of the CPI's expectations in in relation to these PCF register roles? Uh, I think the expectations are rising, and I think that they have uh, they've been very open that their expectations will be rising, and I think that's being being reflected in, in a number of ways. I mean, the first is that they expect firms to have a due diligence process themselves. They don't expect to, for example, interview somebody and have questions arise during the course of that interview that the firm has not considered. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that uh, if, for example, a candidate uh, worked for a firm that had some issues, uh, particularly if the candidate wasn't involved themselves, that that's the, that is the end of the matter. On the, on the negative side, very rarely is that the case. Because increasingly, as, as regulators uh, globally become more active in, in disciplinary cases, there will be cases where uh, a candidate has come from a firm which had issues. Um, and the key thing there is to be absolutely open about those and to set out what happened. If there is a case uh, where um, you're a little too close to the action, it's still worth getting advice on, well, what does it mean? Because the number of cases where the answer will be, I really wouldn't pursue that further, will be very few indeed. There will be many more uh, where um, guidance on how to present the case uh, and the basic principle will be uh, full disclosure. The one thing you do not want to do in those sort of circumstances is end up in an interview and discover that you have put two thirds of the truth mm-hmm. on the table. It, it is very unlikely that you would come out of that interview intact. Uh, so, so the basic principle, if, if there are those sort of issues, is mm-hmm. get them out there, but get some advice on how, how to do that uh, properly. Uh, it's increasingly common for the central bank to interview and they are increasingly interviewing through the goggles of the specific position that you've applied for and how your experience is or is not uh, relevant to that. So, you know, if you think about, you know, fitness and probity, um, well, the probity side of that tends to revolve around um, the sort of issues I'm talking about. So, you know, in extreme cases, they'll be more extreme than that. But, but t- taking it back to the majority mm-hmm. of cases, uh, there'll be things like, for example, where a previous firm had some sort of involvement and you need to be upfront about that. So you tend to come down in the majority of cases to the fitness side, which is around, are, are you a person who has the experience to carry out a senior management role of a particular type in a particular industry that you're involved in? And that's the goggles they're looking at when they mm-hmm. go through their interviews. The, the interviews are becoming longer and they're having more people involved from the central bank. They really want to get out of the bonnet and to understand uh, who are you, uh, how would you carry out this role, and can you demonstrate that you understand the business and that you understand the risks that are associated with that, and that you can carry out the role that you, you've applied for. So those are those are some of the big tests, much more onerous process, uh, specific mm. to the individual areas, and a basic principle that if there are any issues with with the firm in your previous employment, openness is the mm. order of the day. Is there a difficulty for people who haven't been pre-approved already to get approved dur- during COVID, or, or do you see that as being a stumbling block at all? No, what they're what they're doing, what the central bank are doing in connection with that is that, well, for, firstly, they are being more selective about the the interviews yes. that they're carrying out because quite a few of their staff are mm. also working at home. So quite often, what they're doing is a Zoom call where you have, you know, the, the candidates in their house and two or three people from the central bank mm. in three different houses. Uh, so just even as a practical matter, uh, they need to be more selective in what they're doing. Certainly, in some cases, what they're doing is a shorter process. Uh, just as a practical matter. I mean, going on a Zoom call for, for two or three hours is, is just not a practical thing to do. It's exhausting for everybody involved. So, so they are, they are, they're turning out to be shorter interviews. They are probably informally doing more risk assessment to decide uh, which, of those, which of those do they, they want to be involved in. I, I have to say that I think that the status quo um, ante is going to return, which is where they, they are saying that we do want and we are proud that we are putting in place a more over a more, a more onerous process, and uh, if that's a, if we're erring on the, on the side of being a little bit too onerous, that's that's fine. One part one of the one of the items that sometimes comes up 
is if you have somebody in that that what will be, I, th I think, whatever it is, the the world that was there before, and that will be the new world again. And and you, you're working for ABC Bank, and you want to, you've got a position in some other firm, uh, which where where you have an offer. When when do you resign? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, increasingly, what candidates are doing, and I have to say this, if I was advising the candidates, I think there's a lot to be said for this. Is they're saying, look, I'm not resigning until I uh, until yeah. I'm through this process. The chances of my failing are very slight, but I'm not going to take any chance that I find myself having resigned and yet unable to take mm -hmm. up a new role. That's a very good point, and it's something we certainly mm -hmm. come up yes. against when we're, when we're working roles that are carrying that PCF license. Is is the kind of resignation? Uh, point and it, it's a catch-22 because the employer always wants the guarantee that they're going to make the move but the person wants to minimize the risk that they're left with no job just a couple of last points on, on our side kevin and two questions for myself you mentioned that there's a more onerous process in place on the kind of the interview itself has that directly resulted in more people being kind of turned away are we seeing an increase in in, in kind of the central bank saying no to to particular candidates it's very rare that they'll say no formally, um, but what they very often do, I, you know, if, if there's, there's there's a number in, in, I don't have the number to hand immediately. It was, it was high double digit figures, where they said to the candidate, or more more like more in many cases, they said to the firm, uh, look, we are not saying that this person is is not fit and proper, but for the particular role that you are filling on, we're not convinced that they're the right fit. Uh, so uh, we we really think that you should you should consider okay. further. When we're advising candidates, and uh, one of the things we, we say is that look, prep yourself 110 degrees before you go in for that interview, because if you end up coming out the other side, and you genuinely are not the right person for a given role, well, fine, uh, there's nothing nothing anybody can do. But what's very sad is if you don't put your best foot forward, and if that is part of the reason that you end up with a problem at the end of the uh, at the end of the process. Okay. And lastly, then for all the new entrants that are still to come over um, into the Irish market, and that obviously may increase depending on how Brexit goes. What would be your advice if they're looking to to hire um, you know, people in these PCF roles? Um, just to kind of recap based, based on what you've said already, what would be the main takeaways for them to pay attention to? Well, I think that one of the things which has happened, and it's, 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 it's actually happened to a number of the international banks over the last, uh, over the last 12 months at senior levels, is where they're bringing people in, in, uh, over from, I think they've all come from London, but where they're bringing people over from London, uh, the number of them who have been, uh, I, I, use, I say declined with inverted brackets because it, it is more uh, going back to the, uh, the bank in question and saying, look, I, I think you can do better. But that has happened on a number of different occasions. And I think what goes with that is that, that they should be getting advice before they submit the application for a given name to the central bank on on whether that is like what 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 are the, what are what are the rods? Uh, you're not going to get anybody to say, look, uh, I'm giving you guarantees that you'll get through. That that that's just not good. I mean, it could be as simple as that as that you just don't perform on the interview. But but you can get to a point where uh, you particularly where where the risks are, are are on the high side, you can get that advice. And both from the point of view of the bank and the need of the individual, if you are in that territory, if you're in the territory where you have a reasonably high risk of, of of going back to the bank and saying this is not the right person. Well, you'd be better to acknowledge that up front. And, and if you're in a perfectly good job in London, well, you know it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to stay in that perfectly good job in London. Okay, that's it's. it's I, I'm aware of at least three cases. In, in two cases at MD level, and in one, in one case at at uh, at CRO level, um, have applied from London, uh, from from senior positions within the existing financial institution. And where the central bank has said, look, we just, they're, I'm sure they're fine people, but for this particular role, they're not the right people. Well, I think it goes without saying, Kevin, that obviously the advisory services that you provide, you know, across the, the, the culture and risk audits, the, you know, the PCF process, if anybody listening wishes to reach out to you directly to find out more avail of your services, uh, I'd imagine you're, you're happy for them to do so. Yeah, oh, delighted. perfect. And then, uh, likewise, if anybody uh, wants to find out more of the services that, that Kevin provides, then please do reach out to, to ourselves here at Coopman as well. Kevin, it's been a, an absolute pleasure um, getting to, to listen uh, to you speak today and, and learn uh, about the areas that you're involved in. So thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to talk to us today. And thank, thank you, you very much, Kevin. And we'll speak to you again. All the okay, best. Bye. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye. All the best now. Bye.
Thanks for joining us on Conversations with Koopman. If you are looking to hire excellent talent or considering your next career move in front office, risk, compliance or accounting, please reach out to a member of our specialist recruitment team. If you have any questions about the financial services market, feel free to leave a comment below and we will get back to you soon. And if you like this podcast episode, we greatly appreciate a video like, or even better, subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with our latest releases.